And good morning. I am Tamara Scott. Thanks for joining us with Tamara Scott Live. And we bring you truth for you. Uh, our time. Each week we help you when the headlines hit home and I thank you so much for taking time to join us. We have a great show for you today and uh, we all see the headlines. It seems so far away and yet it's right at our front door because it's our friends, our neighbors, our family members who are serving in the continuing, continuing battle in the Middle East and we know as believers we won't have peace in the Middle East until Jesus returns and if we do it will not be uh, a, a good thing um, and will be short-lived in the process. But all of the events that continue to unfold, we'll be talking today with Colonel Ted Spain, who has written the book, uh, Breaking Iraq, 10 Mistakes Made. And so I think you'll find it very interesting. And of course, you can always get these podcasts at um, YouTube, Tamara Scott Live, YouTube, they're all available in archives for you. And you can always go to webcastonelive.com to learn more about what we do here in the studio. I'm thankful to webcastonelive.com for allowing us to air from their studio and also for um, Christians for America. Christians for the number four, America.com has come alongside to help us uh, make sure that we can get this program out to folks as well. Because depending on the topic, and we talk about everything on this show. Because if God's expected you do to live through it, he's directed you how to do it in his word. And so whether it's the Common Core, which we've devoted a lot of time to, and, and on that note, you have the July 1st event happening at the Airport Holiday Inn at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Jenny White, who is the co-founder of Restore Oklahoma Public Education, ROPE, uh, she was very instrumental in having a governor, Mary Fallon, sign the repeal and replace, not just a rename it bill that we've seen in some other states or concerns about that in other states. This is a bill that will cause Oklahoma to repeal the Common Core standards, and during the interim, they'll go back to the standards they had while they write their own standards and dependent from the Common Core because as we know, the Common Core standards are not the rigorous standards they were promised. Uh, they are, there are issues with them in math, students being behind in math when they complete the Common Core education and the curriculum that's aligned with the Common Core. Two years behind, we're hearing uh, from our counterparts across the sea. So that event is 6.30, July 1st. That's a Tuesday at the Airport Holiday Inn in Des Moines, Iowa. If you're close by there, she'll be giving the model and helping us explain how we can repeat that here in Iowa and giving us the update, things we need to know about the Common Core. Also, July 22nd is the non-conform event. Uh, Glenn Beck will be um, providing in theaters, I think 670 theaters now across the nation will be participating. Again, just to outline and update for folks what is happening and taking place in our public education system. <clears throat> and you can get more information on that at the website, We Will Not Conform. Also today is the one-year anniversary that the House, the U.S. House of Representatives, passed the bill on the pain capable. Pain capable so that an, uh, an abortion would not happen. I think it's after uh, five months, 20 weeks. And so this is a great plus for the unborn American in the womb. And we'd like you to put pressure on your senators to ensure that that bill continues forward, as is the intent of a majority of Americans around the country. So those are just a couple of the things we're going to keep you updated on. But I'm going to go now to our guest. I want to give as much program time to a retired Colonel, Colonel Ted, Ted Spain. Colonel, thank you for joining me. Good morning, ma'am. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And, and uh, Ryan, I've got a little bit of, of uh, audio here where I'm not hearing the colonel. Let's see what I can do. All right, good morning, colonel. Let's try that again. Good morning, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Here, here's mine. Should we try this one? And Colonel, can you you can hear me all right? Correct. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you fine. 
All right. Well, we're having problems with one of our audio boxes here. We've not had to deal with that, which, oddly enough, is one of the questions I was going to ask you. Um, in the field, are there times when, I, I mean, there are days when my email doesn't work, when my phone's acting up. What do you do on the field when you have those situations? Because you are flying impromptu most times, I would guess. So how do you handle those glitches? Well, it does happen in combat. Uh, one of the many lessons I've learned is you position you position yourself where you have communications. It may not be exactly where you want to be tactically, but if you can't communicate with your senior commanders and your junior commanders, then, you, of course, you can't command and control the battle. So you have to go to where you can get communications, and you have to have backup communications. And so if, if something happens that you just don't have it, have you trained your men? Do they have a pretty good idea of what the mission is before you head in? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, first off, I want to thank you for your service to our country. I want to thank you uh, for our listeners and our viewers out there. I apologize again for the audio trouble. And for those of you who are viewing, you you see it all. We are live. There is no retake, uh, which is much of our life, frankly, and we all ought to be thinking that through. But uh, the colonel I had not met, and I was doing an interview on another radio network, and he was kind enough when the wheels hit the ground to pick up his cell phone and give me a call so we could update listeners on what was happening uh, in Iraq. Let's let our listeners know you've written a book called Breaking Iraq, Ten Mistakes Made. What prompted you to write that book? It was based on some some of your listeners may be familiar with Tom Ricks. He wrote a fantastic book called Fiasco. He came in, uh, in Iraq shortly after we took Baghdad, spent a day with me. So when he was writing his book a couple of years later, he contacted me. Uh, I had retired. I was living in Virginia, and he came down and did an eight-hour tape to use to put a couple of pages in his book about my involvement with the Iraqi police. And at the end of that, he was so fascinated, he told me, he said, you have got to write a book. You've got to document because you have so many unique experiences that no one else was involved with, and if you don't do it, it'll just be lost in history. And that's what... That's what got me thinking about the book. And so you started the book in what year? Well, I started that. I did the interview with him in January of 2005, the first month I was retired. He asked to talk to me earlier, but I was still on active duty, and I couldn't talk to him. So I met with him when I retired, and but I was still working on a corporate job. So I just really just took my notes. I saved all my notebooks from Iraq. So... Based on his comments, I thought I better go through now and start recording uh, my current knowledge after leaving Iraq. So I went through and typed up all my notes. But I think more importantly, after I would type a briefing I gave or comments I had or meetings I was sitting in with the senior leaders or senior Iraqi officials, I then put down, by virtue of hindsight, how everything played out. And I ended up with a 317-page typewritten document. And that really was the basis of the book. So in the book, if you see something in quotations, it is exactly word for word, exactly what I said in Baghdad on that particular day. Now, have you heard from others that you either served with or were over there at the same time or possibly uh, people in the administration? Are they pleased with your book, not pleased with your book? What's the response of, of, of those People. That's amazing. I've been asked that so many times. I really have not heard uh, anything negative from any government officials. I was asked when it first came out if I had it cleared through the military, and I chose not to do that. I don't have any classified information in there, which is really what they want to check for. It, but quite honestly, I didn't want I didn't want my book to be censored or uh, changed, so I chose not to have it reviewed. Now I have not heard in the book I talk about uh, less than flattering words in some cases about uh, General Sanchez, General Karpinski, and Secretary Rumsfeld, and uh, and Bernie Carrick, who was just released from federal prison not long ago. Uh, I very, uh, wasn't very kind to them, but I've heard nothing from them. Ninety-nine percent of anything I've heard has just been all positive, and it was just, as you said, from the commanders that were with me in Iraq and countless soldiers that were with me in Iraq. Well, here's what uh, Tom Ricks says about your book that it is unvarnished, an unvarnished account of one brigade, brigade's commander's tour of duty in Baghdad during the tumultuous, tumultuous first year of the American occupation. So I want to ask right there, he calls it the American occupation. Some people call it the American invasion. I guess I wrote American intervention when I was putting the promo out for this show. What do you consider it, an occupation, an intervention, and an invasion? 
I call it an occupation, but that is that is the politically incorrect word to use. But that's in fact what we were doing. We in fact occupied Iraq after we after we uh, took the country. And I'm not supposed to say take the country either, but that's exactly what we did. We took the country and we occupied the country until December 11th, when we uh, basically cut and run. And you see what's going on there right now. And December 11th, when you cut and run, that was the current administration's plan and design. Well, yes, ma'am. The president was elected. One of the reasons he was elected was to end the war in Iraq. And so even though... uh, Go ahead. No, I was going to say we left before the mission. That's just something that just strikes any military commander the wrong way. You just simply don't leave before the mission is accomplished. And that's exactly what we did. Well, and that's what struck so many Americans in the earlier... Uh, well, the later part of the last century with Desert Storm, many felt we didn't stay and finish the job by taking Hussein out of power at that point, but it was, if I understand it correct, a U.N. mission, and it wasn't totally up to the United States. So should we have finished the job in the 90s? I don't think so. I'm probably in the minority there. That, I think as soon as if you'd have gone into Baghdad then, the entire coalition, we, you literally, we really did have a coalition during Desert Storm. This uh, in fact, there's a chapter in my book talking about the coalition of the of the willing, but it really was a coalition of the unwilling because it really was only the, the 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 UK was really about the only uh, ally that we had that has any significant forces that uh, we could do anything with. There was a Polish division that had about 30 countries, but most of those countries were only contributing uh, you know 20, 30 soldiers, and they never left the uh, they never left the uh, their uh, forward operating base, and it made it very clear to me that they, their country would not allow them to participate in combat operations. So the world was probably not ready for the U.S. to take further action in the 90s. But in this instance, when you say that we, we left before the mission was finished, so now we're seeing the results of that, the impact of what's happening. Before we get into the 10 mistakes in your book, can you just kind of address to our listeners and our viewers what your opinion is on what's happening and unfolding in Iraq right now as we see it on our TV screens? It's quite concerning. Yes, ma'am. What is happening even even right now, they're the, primarily the ISIS, uh, but also uh, Sunni militants are about 40 miles outside of Baghdad. They have now moved and basically got about three-quarters of... Uh, Baghdad surrounded, and Baghdad, even during our time, even during our planning, when we were planning for the invasion, we knew then that Baghdad was what we in the military called a center of gravity. Even And then once we moved in and I started meeting with all the Iraqi police generals, they told me the same thing. They said, whatever Baghdad does, the rest of the country um, follows. So that was my main mission, was trying to assist in controlling Baghdad. That's where my main effort was, and that's really where what's going on now. You have, as you know, the Shia in the south, and then now the Sunnis have taken over a large portion of Syria and a portion of of Iraq. But in all fairness, they have not received, they have not had much resistance at all, because a lot of those are Sunni sympathizers that they've dealt with. Once you get into Baghdad, now you're going to start getting into the Shia. You're going to get into the, some of the religious beliefs. Uh, Part of my book, I talk about I lost a battalion commander. Three of the 13 soldiers I had killed were in a fight in the middle of a fight between Sistani and al Sadr, or two of the Shia clerics that uh, hate each other. But I suspect right now, ironically, they are pulling together to repel the Sunnis. Uh, the Sunnis are not going to be able to just walk in and take Baghdad. I think you'll see, and it's already started, you'll see some car bombings going on. I think they set off a big car bomb yesterday in al Sadr. They were moving in on the airport this morning. Uh, so... It really goes back to just like it was when I was there. And what was unique about Baghdad, though, however, half of Baghdad was Sunni, essentially half was Shia, whereas everywhere else you went in Iraq, it was either primarily Shia or primarily Sunni. So for many of us, we thought things were somewhat under control, and I and you and I, you were good enough to do that interview with me earlier this week, and I brought in the article on Afghanistan, a different country, but same concern um, 86% of casualties that happened in Afghanistan to date, 86% have happened under Obama's watch. And I'm not trying to just make this political, but this is a great concern when you could think that we were there since 2001 and only 13% of the injuries took place from 2001 to 2009. But since 2009, we've had 86%. 
casualties. Yes, ma- yes ma'am. And, p- and part of that is the number of the forces that we put in there. You know, originally after 9-11, originally the main focus was on Afghanistan, and then we shifted the focus over to Iraq. And then, of course, once the troops were pulled out in uh, December of 2011, the, the main focus went back to Afghanistan. And quite honestly, that the bad guys, that uh, whereas before you could, you could, uh, if you wanted to kill Americans, the best place was Iraq. And then once we pulled out, and of course, they, many of them shifted the emphasis to Afghanistan. So part of that is because of our increased involvement, and then part of that is because the enemy uh, increased their attacks also. And so in Iraq? Oh. Is uh, it- no, in Afghanistan. Once we, right. once we pulled out of Iraq, right after we took uh, Baghdad and some of the uh, Attacks that we went under were not from Saddam's previous army, but they were some coming in from Syria, coming in from Iran. Uh, more and more IEDs showed up that were being made in Iran. All those things were going on even while I was there that first year. Right. So, so what we saw happen in Afghanistan, are we now going to see that in Iraq? The, the, because we've left, because our troops are no longer there, now we're going to see a greater... greater do we leave them in a better state or a worse? In Iraq or in Afghanistan? In, moving back to Iraq. Oh, yeah. Well, no, Iraq, we, we, obviously we pulled out prematurely. We could have left between ten and 20,000 troops there. You would have, I don't, you wouldn't even be having issues that you have right now. Uh, and, and we're going to have to end up, it's in our, you know, everything, all wars are political. So we just got to say that right up front. Everything is about politics. All wars are political. And we or we get involved in uh, skirmishes that are in our best interest. Uh, I've been asked countless times, you know, where were the weapons of mass destruction? I've personally sat in top secret briefings showing the locations of chemical, mobile chemical labs. At the time, I thought when we were going into Kuwait to posture along the border, the Iraqi border, I think some of those moved into Syria. I've been hoping every day that some of the stuff in Syria, they would find some of uh, Saddam's chemical weapons. I don't know that anymore. I don't know if they existed. That certainly, and if they didn't, that will certainly go down in one of the largest intel failures in our country. Uh, now, do I think we were using weapons of mass destruction as an excuse to invade? I personally do. I don't know that anybody would argue that a legitimate democracy in Iraq is in our best interest. There's no doubt about that. Just look at the neighbors there. Would uh, you just look at the neighboring countries? But uh, we obviously miscalculated. Okay, and I'm going to ask you one more question before we get to your ten mistakes, and and then we'll go to a break. We have about two minutes left. The Bergdahl situation. What should Americans be thinking, questioning on this situation? I can't speak for all of the military, but I think I speak for the vast majority of the military. We're, we're extremely upset. I think the best way to address that is, here's what my expert, I knew every day. I was on the streets of Baghdad every day. I knew every day I could be captured. I was being targeted because of my position. I knew that. Uh, I survived a couple of assassination attempts, so I knew I was the target. Uh, I had personally decided, never discussed it with anybody, but I had personally decided that uh, if I thought my capture was imminent and I had a chance to fight to my death, I personally chose to to fight to my death because I didn't want to be captured. I knew what uh, they did to the soldiers that they captured with, with Jessica Lynch. It's too graphic to talk about on your show. But I knew what they had done uh, there. I'd seen a lot of the atrocities. I'd seen the mass graves and stuff. I personally felt if I had an opportunity to, to fight, I would do that. However, and, and if I'd been captured, I, uh, my expectation was that the U.S. would try to free me. But I never once thought uh, that the U.S., or nor did I expect the U.S. to trade prisoners for me. That's just not what we expect. Now, when you talk about Burga, it's common knowledge that he deserted. He called back the day after he left. It's been known they did a 15-6 investigation back then. He des- he's a deserter. So the only way you could have made this more irritable to the military was uh, was give five really bad guys to, uh, you know, I've been asked about five. You know, what's the right? One to one, five to one, ten to one? I mean, I don't know. But uh, uh, releasing those people to get back, especially a deserter, somebody to turn their back on the country, it just it just makes me sick to my stomach. Okay. I am talking with Colonel, retired Colonel Ted Spain. He's got a new book, uh, Breaking Iraq, Ten Mistakes Made. And I would guess to tell you this is an honest view 
of soldiers in the field, of leaders in, uh, for our, our troops, of what took place. And we'll be joining back to talk about this after these messages. I hope you'll stay tuned. I am Tamara Scott, Tamara Scott Live, and we're going to be joining in, going live on our American Family Radio Network's program with Restoring Hope. So stay tuned. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray, we're safe! Credit, you're our hero! Hey, what's wrong? Logan wants Let's Rock Elmo for his birthday, but since Steve lost his job, I don't think we can afford it. What did you do for money last year when you and John were struggling to make ends meet? My secret? I went to me and Mommy to be. We sold all of Megan and Ryan's clothes and toys there. They give back the highest percentage on their items in the area. And it was so easy. Megan's clothes? She's 15. Yes, they can sign newborn through trendy teens. We're not struggling now, but I'm going to keep saving and making money at me and Mommy to be. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations, change your life, change your relationships, transform your world. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart, and it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car, everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent. Restoring hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. And thank you for staying tuned with us. I am Tamara Scott on Tamara Scott Live, and we're coming in with Restoring Hope. What a perfect uh, title for a show, but what a perfect work that Mac does. And we appreciate his ability to get in and help folks uh, who are recovering, uh, whatever the issue. As we do this show, it's to help you get uh, God's word in today's world when the headlines hit home. We have help for you that way. And I figure uh, no matter what the situation, if God's expected you how to lo live it, he's directed you how to do it. And so we tackle a host of topics on this portion of this segment with Tamara Scott Live, and I'm thankful for Restoring Hope for allowing us to do that and also for Christians for America and helping us be able to do that as well uh, financially. And if you'd like to come on and, and, and be a partner with us, we'd love to have you. We're talking right now, we're joining in a conversation that we've had, that we began, as you know, we tape this show Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. You're always welcome to pop in and join that live conversation with us each Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, webcast1live.com. Webcast1live.com is the best way to do that. Our conversation today is with Colonel, retired Colonel Ted Spain. He's written a book called Breaking I Rock, 10 Mistakes Made. And if you want to hear the whole program or an archive of it, please go to Tamara Scott Live on YouTube. But right now we're just going to jump back into our conversation, if you'll allow me. And the colonel, first off, I just have to note, 
he was explaining to us in the earlier portion of the program the threat every day walking on the streets of Iraq knowing you could be captured, killed, and what would happen to you possibly had you been captured, the danger and the atrocities of the treatment. And I'm hearing this warrior. This is a soldier, a commander, a warrior, a colonel in the brigade, the tour of duty in Baghdad. And yet, Colonel, as I'm hearing you, I hear a gentleness in your voice, and it takes us back. It's surprising to us, the gentle spirits of, of strong men and women like yourself who are in the battle. Thank you. Oh boy. Yeah. Let me ask you, are, do you have family back here in the States? Are you married? Oh, yes, ma'am. In fact, my wife is a retired uh, lieutenant colonel. So she as well then understands the threat, but she has a little bit of an understanding when you go away. She might have a piece that some of those who are not with a military background may not have. Well, yes, ma'am. She was at, uh, in fact, she'd been recalled to active duty because of 9-11, and she was serving in Germany. Uh, my unit was out of Germany. We left Germany, went into Kuwait, and then into, into Iraq. And, uh, of course, she remained in Germany and was involved a lot with the family members as well as dealing with our own uh, two children. Well, then I have a title for your next book. I think you should two should write a book together called Married is, Marriage is a Combat Sport. <laughs> okay, I will, I will tell her that. <laughs> I think you both could have a great, unique perspective on that. So you've written this book, The Ten Mistakes Made, and I want to go into it right away. Uh, your first mistake you mentioned, give us, what, what was the first mistake? Well, the, the the book revolves, and I do need to clarify, the, the book was released last last year, 19 March of last year, was okay. the 10th anniversary of the invasion. We invaded in March of 2003, so March of 2013, about, what, 15, 16 months ago is when the book was released. So it's been out for a little over a year. And it just overall, it's I talked about the 10 mistakes that revolved around our attempt to establish the rule of law uh, after the invasion and the occupation. There's really nothing out there that talks about not much coverage about Iraqi police. So that that's one of the reasons that I woke, wrote it. And the reason it's called Breaking Iraq, you may recall General Powell saying, you know, if you break it, you own it. Well, we broke it, we owned it, and we didn't have a plan to put it back together. And, and we were much better at winning the war, but we really didn't know how to win the peace. And if you take the 10 mistakes, and there's a chapter on each of the mistakes, and it's, they're kind of under five broad categories. And one is you got to have the right uh, number and type of soldiers, and, and we didn't. Of course, I'm biased because of military police. We, we had a extreme shortage of military police, which is what we really needed a lot of once we took the, uh, to, especially when we took uh, Baghdad. And then I have two or three chapters talking about the challenge of establishing the, the rule of law, because you, you want to have law and order. And as I've tried to explain to some of the uh, combat arms generals over there, you know, tonight if you have an issue at your house and you call 911, it's your expectation that the local police show up, certainly not the Army. And it took them a while. I think it was around 2006 before they actually started taking the Iraqi police very serious, and that's when they brought Petraeus back in, and, and then they started training uh getting really serious about training the Iraqi police. So I talk about, talk about all of that. I talk about also about the detainees. Uh, I was involved. I am the one that was responsible for opening Abu Ghraib prison. So I talk about how that came about. And the, the detainees, I, I've got a chapter in there talking about detainees and uh, the uh, intel that we were getting from them. And, and in some cases, the mistreatment that was taking place that set the stage for that scandal at Abu Ghraib prison. And then I, and there's some leadership I addressed. Three of the chapters talk about, one's about General Kropinski, and now Colonel Kropinski, but she was, I handed over Bugra Prison to her and her unit uh, in June of 03, and we all know how that went. And then General Sanchez was the senior general there, got a chapter about my dealings with him, and, and quite honestly, his focus more on the war side than the, the hearts and minds of the of the Iraqi people, and then a chapter with Bernie Carrick, who was brought in by uh, President Bush. Uh, Carrick, you may recall, was the New York City police chief on 9-11, and uh, my dealings with him and his lack of really involvement. And then I talk in there also about the senior civilian leadership, the senior military leadership, and then dealing with our allies. And then the last part is talking about trying to create a legitimate police force. So that's kind of the broad categories. And then, and like I said, there's a chapter on each of those main points. And this is a first-person book, and this is a book based on my personal dealings. And, and for our listeners on American Family Radio, you did not run this through the military. 
You didn't give up sensitive information that shouldn't have been shared, but you didn't run it through the military, so it was not censored. Right, absolutely. That was my main thing. And, and, and someone tried to tell me that, well, when you retired, you knew that you were supposed to clear it with the military. And General Borkin, as a matter of fact, that just got released. I didn't even notice until about two weeks ago. General Borkin is a retired three-star, and he wrote a book about uh, some special ops stuff. But uh, I just found out he actually got a letter of reprimand from the Army when he was retiring because of writing the book. But he had classified information in there. Uh, I, the information in there, of course, some of that would have been classified at time because current operations were classified. But once they've taken place, there was a couple of things that I that even right now that I've never told, never told my wife, never told anybody because it could affect current operations in Iraq. So obviously, there's nothing in there that has no has any impact on uh, you know Iraq after I left. And I was very sensitive to that. Okay, so thank you for for allowing us that. So if someone wanted to read your book who was not of a military background, would they be able to follow along, and would it hold their interest? Is it is it written from such a military background that it's for those in the game? Would those of us outside the game find it interesting and be able to understand it? No, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's a, that's. Uh very perceptive that you mentioned that because when we before we started it once once we had a publisher from New York, he asked me the very one of my very first conversations. He said, "Do you know what a military enthusiast is?" And I said, "No, sir." He said, "There, there are people that read books about the military, but they've never served in the military. They're just fascinated about the military, and this is what this book has got to appeal to." And I have received all kinds of emails and Facebook messages and letters and stuff from folks that never served a day in the military, but just talked about how they understood it. Because, like I said, it's a first-person book. There's not big words in there because I'm I am the product of a North Carolina public education, so <laughs> I don't I don't use big words. I don't write fancy stuff, and I just I've never had anybody at all say that they had any issues reading it. My high school buddies, uh, none of them really served in the military, and uh, they all just absolutely. Found out, I've had a lot of them tell me, hey, this is the only military book I've ever read. Okay. Because, you know, they knew me. Very good. Well, so thank you, one, for writing the book. Thank you, two, for your service. We so appreciate that. And and to hear you and get to talk to you, like I said, to hear your heart. When, when, when we hear our troops over, over there and we hear people want to criticize what our troops are doing, we wonder, are our troops mistreating people? And when I hear your voice, I can't imagine that you would mistreat anyone or undo action. So I, th- I thank you for, for your service and and sharing with us today. Let's start with with the first point, Secretary Rumfeld's deployment plans. They didn't include the adequate number of military police. What? Why? What, what, what should we have done dis- differently? It's, well, you may recall that Secretary Rumsfeld was in the process of transforming the military when, when 9-11 came around. In fact, I went to the U.S. Army War College for a year from the summer of 2000 into the summer of 2001, ironically graduating just three or four months before 9-11. And uh, and we studied a lot about the, the new military. So I got to be, be able to move fast and all of that stuff. And so that process had started. But then, so we really basically got caught short. And I even talk in my book about uh, President Clinton, uh, as you know, was elected in 92 and drew down the military. We went from, for example, in the active army from 16 divisions down to 10 divisions. And as I say in the book, you, you can you can break down an army. We're doing that right now again. Right. You can break down an army pretty soon, but you just can't rebuild an army overnight. So therefore, we were caught short with a uh, shortage of personnel and, and shortage of equipment. I myself, when I when we invaded, I had a flat, I was wearing a flak vest from the Vietnam era that wouldn't even stop an AK-47 round. And that should not happen in this country. It absolutely couldn't happen. I lost soldiers. I had soldiers killed that had inadequate equipment. I had units showing up that had Humvees that had canvas tops on them. Uh, and I saw what IEDs did to those to those vehicles and stuff. So that shouldn't happen. But back specifically about Secretary Rumsfeld and the number of, of military police, he front-loaded, of course, what you needed to take the country. And you have to have that. There's, everybody supports that. that. That ground campaign from Kuwait to Baghdad will be studied for years to come. It was like a blitzkrieg. I've never been so proud to be part of anything in my life. However... Once you take the country, now you and, – and this is embarrassing to say, but the plan at the time was to take the country, stand up the government, and we were going to leave. We honestly – it's silly now, but we honestly believe we would be there less than a year. Uh, it, it's hard to believe right now saying that, but that's what the plan was. But uh, Well, and we came in with such – 
we came in with such shock and awe. I mean, it was such an impressive display that we all watched on our TVs. Uh, so we did see that, for, I mean, even in our end, we thought perhaps you all could go do your business and come back quickly. We never th- dreamt that we would still, 2014, be involved in this. It's, and, 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 and the worst is yet to come. We're, we're going to be, uh, I, I just can't imagine we're not, we're, that we will not, in the future, have to send more troops back in there. And I think our president is now talking about it, ag- again, at least with the special forces. And as you said, there are probably special forces already in Iraq. They probably never yeah. left. They're, they're in there. We always said we were getting intel. Uh, you know, there were special ops uh, on the ground feeding us information. Even when we were in Kuwait, before we even entered Iraq, we were getting information from the streets of Baghdad. That shouldn't surprise you. That's not classified. Um so those things go on, and there's several purposes for that. Of course, the embassy is absolutely huge. Someone, I think, said it was our largest embassy. I'm not sure about that, but it's absolutely huge. It's down in the green zone where the palace, Saddam's palaces used to be. I've been in there many times. That's where I had to go in to meet with uh, Ambassador Bremer and, and uh, Bernie Carrick and those crew. But uh, So some of those forces are going in to help secure the embassy, but, you know, a lot's been talking about air campaign. Well, drone, I was asked yesterday on a radio interview out of Florida, well, why don't we send in drones and stuff? Well, air, there, there's a limit to the air campaign. You've got to have people identifying the targets. It's not like you see in the movies where you just fly over and just start dropping bombs and stuff. So your special ops can, of course, go in there. They can laser those, use a laser and laser targets and stuff. And we have smart bombs and we have Tomahawk missiles and cruise missiles that, that – can go in and take out. But when that happens, and I think we'll eventually bring, bring in the air campaign, but what you're going to see then is you're going to see civilian casualties. And you're going to see pictures of women and children laying out dead. Whether we killed them or not, you're going to see those pictures, and it's going to be told to the media that those were Americans that killed killed those people. That's going to happen. There's collateral damage, and combat is an absolute terrible thing. It is a very chaotic situation. Uh, anybody that has served in combat that tells you they love war, there's something wrong with them. So I have so many questions I want to ask you, and we're only on the first point. Let me ask you, 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 you think we'll be back in there. Would, if you were commander, what would be your attack plan from this point forward into Iraq? God, what a great question. It is so messed up. Here, here's what the you can't really throw in what I, you know, we used to say in the military, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Well, there's a limit to that. You know, using that using that logic, we would we would work with Iran. Well, see, Iran's a bigger threat to us right now than Iraq is. But you, you, I think you're going to see Iranian forces go in. We better be really careful that we, that we don't appear to be anti-Sunni, which is what I'm concerned we're going to end up doing. But to answer your question, I simply don't know other than providing intel to Maliki. And see, Maliki is not the right president in there, but, you know, you have to play the hand you're dealt. So uh, we, we've got to provide intel to Maliki. We may have to provide him logistical support. Um, but I, I don't know how you avoid what's about to happen with the, the car bombs that are going to be going off on a daily basis there in, in, in uh, Baghdad. You know, it's so it is so messed up right now. It should have never got obviously to the point it is now. So I don't know what uh, I don't know what the president's going to do to hold the world opinion together and to not appear to be anti-Sunni and not to throw in with Iran because Iran would love to do that. And then you got Saudi Arabia that allegedly is funding ISIS because they're Sunni also. And, of course, Israel's sitting right there watching everything. Jordan's sitting there watching everything. This is, this is a mess, a truly huge mess. And I think aren't we dealing with the possibility of um, scaling back some of the sanctions on Iran right now because there may be a possibility the U.S. is going to join forces with them? I just don't see how we will join forces. I, I don't know. You can believe behind the scenes we're certainly discussing uh, – we're in we're in consultation with Iran. I can see, and I don't I don't have any any more information than you do. But I can see where we may turn our heads a little bit on some of the Iranian forces coming in here because they've got some fantastic fighters. Uh, that's that's probably I suspect the limit of what you'll see that that you won't ever know about is that we'll turn our head and let Iran go in and do a few things. 
but I don't see any public support for Iran. And then after this is all over, you know, it's like the old, your, your enemy's enemy is your friend. Yeah, well, okay, but then they're your enemy. They're still your enemy after it's all over. And Iran is a huge threat to the United States. And hasn't so, that gotten us in trouble in the past when we have armed, whether it's insurgents or, or forces, and then that group has turned against us, and we end up fighting them in another conflict? Oh, absolutely. Well, look what we did when the Soviets were, was in Afghanistan. We gave Stinger missiles to the Afghan rebels. And then look what, you know, look how some of those were used after the Soviets pulled out. So absolutely, you, you're right. In fact, there was up until just a couple hours ago, there was talk that they had some Stinger missiles there in northern Iraq. And then General King went on TV about an hour ago and said that he has checked his sources and that we did not give any Stinger missiles. So that any missiles they have that ISIS has, they didn't get from from the Americans. So that's that, that that's a game changer. They get they start getting their hands on Stinger missiles, and they end up here in the United States. They can bring down commercial aircraft. Of course, they can bring down military aircraft there in Iraq, and they're certainly a threat to uh, that whole region. For those of you who may be just turning in, I'm speaking with Colonel, retired Colonel Ted Spain. He's written a book called Breaking Iraq, The Ten Mistakes That Broke Iraq. And uh, we're going through some of those mistakes now, and you can get a uh, archive of this program at Tamara Scott Live on YouTube if you want to hear the whole conversation. As tempted as I am, there are 100 questions I'd like to ask you, and we're only on point one. I'm going to, to bring myself back. Number two, law and order. You talked about it briefly. We failed to provide a police system to provide security to the Iraqi citizenry and instill a sense of trust. So how, how, do, how do we recover from that? Well, I'm not sure you do then. I, when, we, when we talk to Baghdad and I get out on the streets, of course, every day I talk to Iraqi police, I talk to Iraqi business owners, and I talk to Iraqi citizens just on the street. They did not trust the, uh, the Iraqi police. Now, some folks, some, some media has said that, well, you know, uh, Iraqi police was an arm of Saddam. They really were not. They were, they were far enough down on the pecking order. They just pretty much did what the uh, uh, Saddam's intel sources told them to do. But they were very corrupt, extremely corrupt. And they were not trusted by uh, any of the Iraqi uh, people. And I was a total failure at trying to – that's not something you just turn around, you know, in a few months. Uh, and and we, we tried that. But uh, during the pre-war planning, uh, you know, my, and, I'm, and I'm guilty. I'm responsible for a lot of these failures because I didn't uh, push the issue. For an example, I had no intel on any of the Iraqi police generals, but yet I had intel on the senior – uh, Iraqi army leaders for Saddam. <clears throat> we knew who the division commanders were. I had documents I'd seen that where did they go to school, how loyal they were to Saddam. You know, we, we studied all that so we know how much resistance we get. And and the plan actually called for when we, the Battle of Baghdad was supposed to last two or three months. We were going to circle Baghdad, check, choke it off, and we were prepared, had trained, and the plan called for door to door fight. But we were still very much affected from Mogadishu and the troops that got stranded there. So we trained a lot to try to avoid that. That was my huge that, – that, that was my, really my number one focus initially was, well, what if my soldiers got trapped in some of those buildings there in Baghdad, which is an absolutely huge city, had 6 million people in it when we invaded. Uh, so that's where my focus was. I thought at the time that during the Battle of Baghdad, during that two- to three-month period – I would then have time to see how the Iraqi police had responded and how they were reacting to the battle. And then I thought I was going to have time to plan accordingly. But Baghdad fell much sooner than much sooner than what the plan called for because of the success of the thunder runs that were going into the airport and going down to Saddam's headquarters. And uh, when my fellow brigade commanders, two of them, fought their way all the way in, then they hunkered down and just fought off the counterattacks, which is not what the uh, plan was. So bottom line is I got caught short. And then uh, the CPA folks mistakenly put a, a – they said that the radio messed it up. I don't know who messed it up, but a, a, a thing went all across Baghdad asking all the Iraqi police to return to duty, and thousands and thousands of them showed up at the police academy. I will never forget the day I went out there, and just thousands of them were there, and it was it was just riot. It was it was almost like riots going on out there. So, but we just we just didn't plan for it. And then the senior uh, American generals, the combat arms generals, just didn't think that the Iraqi police were an important 
uh, an important part of the solution here. And it took them a couple of years to figure that out because that was after my time. So, Colonel, we have maybe just four minutes left with our folks at American Family Radio and those listeners. And, of course, we'll continue this conversation, and you can watch it at Tamara Scott Live on YouTube. But I want to give you the opportunity, uh, before we before we have to go, what's the next um, mistake that you want to mention for those listeners? Well, I, I think instead of talking about that, I, I, my message to you listeners are, yeah, you know, and if I ever did write another book, it would be when is it, when is conflict worth the life of one American soldier? I tell you what haunts me every day. I lost 13 soldiers, and years ago when I was out doing speeches and stuff, they would say, "Hey, what's your biggest concern about Iraq?" And I would never hesitate. I would always say that my biggest concern is I ever live long enough to think that my soldiers died in vain. And this is the first time as I watch what's going on right now on TV, I am coming very close to the conclusion that perhaps not only just my 13 soldiers that died, but the other soldiers that I sent home that didn't have all the arms and legs, and those that are in counseling now, and all of us that have been emotionally affected by this, and for what? to, to, to it, Was it in vain? And I hope I never conclude that it was in vain, but it sure looks like that's what's about to happen. Well, you... that, that is what I, that is my number one concern in life right there. And, and what did we learn from it? Are we going to make the same mistake again? Yeah, probably. You're absolutely right. That's the concern of most Americans as we're watching it unfold on TV. Are you an anomaly in the military, or are most commanders that you know, do they all have that same regard for their fellow sur- soldiers and those who are under them? You know, I've never been asked that of all the interviews I've ever done because, quite honestly, uh, I would say that there are some that, but but I had other commanders telling me, hey, that's just that's part of war. But, okay. And I had some that talk about losing equipment the same way they lost soldiers. Okay. I, just, I can replace equipment. I can't replace my soldiers. We so appreciate the heart of Colonel Retired Retire, retired Colonel Ted Spade. We Ted Spade. We've got to. The book is um, Breaking Iraq: Ten Mistakes Made. We're going to take our break from AFR, but you can join us again at, at Tamara Scott Live for the remainder of this program. Stay with us for those of you who are listening live today, Wednesday at 10 a.m. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am administrative manager. I am the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free. What type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee. All of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, 
and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me, but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there, they're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And I am Tamara Scott. You're listening live or watching at 10 a.m. on webcast1live.com. We thank them for allowing us to air through their studio and all of the help that J. Michael McCoy has given us on this, on this show. Um, we've been talking with Colonel Ted Spain, retired colonel, and he's written a book called Breaking Iraq, Ten Mistakes Made. And we're so appreciative of his just very calm ability to take us through and walk us through what our loved ones, our friends, and our family members were going through. I remember uh, interviewing soldiers back in the earlier part of this um, um, mission in 2003 and 2004, and the concerns over the um, terms of engagement, and, and, as, and as the colonel has shared on this program, some of the equipment that they had was outdated and not what they needed for the area. So if you want to get the whole program, please, you can go to Tamara Scott Live at YouTube. Uh, it's all available there for you for information. We've got to get the word out, let people know what's happening and what we can do to better improve this. Colonel, can I, can I ask you, I'm going to be, I've, d I've done Concerned Women for America is an organization that I work with, and we do a great deal in Iowa out of support for our veterans. And then on another level, in a different hat, I'll be going as a volunteer on another honor flight to D.C. with our World War II. Actually, this is with our Korean veterans. So pleased to be able to honor them in that way. We're talking about 10 mistakes made in Iraq. Every conflict we've had there have been mistakes made. It's not that you're coming out and trying to criticize or create problems. You've just analyzed it so we can look at them and go forward. Would you say that's correct? Oh, yes, ma'am. In fact, in the book, I'm more critical of myself than any other person in there. I sense that even in our interview. You, you, you're you very hard on yourself. So, uh, and, I, and I can't imagine making the life-death decisions that you make with a moment, only a moment to decide. Well, that's exactly what happened. I've got uh, the notes that I used when I went around and talked to the soldiers before we left Germany, and one thing that has always stuck in my mind, in fact, one of the persons I talked to was PFC Rachel Bosvell, and one of the first females killed in Iraq was one of my soldiers, and I remember telling her company that that's exactly right. You've got a split, split, section, a split second to determine if that 12-year-old kid running up to you, if they're handing you a candy bar or handing you a hand grenade. And you got a, just a fraction of a second to decide whether you're going to take that kid's life, and that's uh, that's something that you can't explain to people. I, you know, I I can't explain that to my wife. I don't try to sit and make her feel like, you know, you really can only talk about combat with other folks that have been in combat because you just can't understand it. Those security guys that live with me that I'm alive today because of the work that my personal security detail did, and and we're just brothers for life. I mean, they, they, I'm alive. Because of that, I say brothers, brothers and sisters, because it was male and female, and uh, we just believed in, in what we were doing. And you know, when the shooting starts, you're really fighting for that soldier on your left and right, because you really all want to go home. And the book uh, would be easily understandable for those of us who aren't in the military, and it would help us understand actually what is taking place even today. I think It'd be a, a, a good idea for those of you. Um, interested in this and, and knowing the truth. But for me, in the political realm, it gives me a better understanding. And for those of us who were in an election cycle, we'll be, uh, we'll be deciding who is going to be our next U.S. Senator here in Iowa. And next, we've got four congressional races up for grabs. What are questions that you think we need to be asking those who are offering to serve at the national level? 
Well, I mean, certainly you, I would ask, I would certainly ask them that thought about when is when is it. Here's what most military people would want. We we understand that these these political leaders have various elements of power, and what most people like me want is you you use your other elements of power, diplomatic, economic, and so forth. And when the only way to achieve on that, a strategic, vital national interest is through the use of the military, then you got to go all in, and you got to go in, and you got to go in and win. But it's these cases like in Iraq and soon to be Afghanistan where you get halfway in, and then you pull out, and for what? I mean, look at what, look what happened to Vietnam once we pulled out of Vietnam. Uh, so that that's the thing. In fact, I talk in the book about Sheila Jackson Lee, a congresswoman from. Texas, and she met. I met with lots of congressmen, but she she particularly stays in my mind because she was trying to get her best to get me to say. She asked me. She said, "Do you agree with the president's decision to invade Iraq?" I said, "Man, what kind of question is that to ask a soldier?" I said, "You politicians sent us here. Uh, we work for uh, you know we work for the political. We work for civilian leadership, and and." Uh, so I explained to her my thoughts on that, and she said, "Well, you understand that this is just politics, don't you, Colonel?" And I said, ma'am, you just said the wrong thing. I said, you, I, I said, I've been to 13 memorials for my soldiers. I said, you go with me to a memorial, and you stand there and, 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 and see what those soldiers go through, and then you tell me it's just politics. I said, you're going to be on TV next week. You're going to be on Meet the Press telling the American people about your trip to, to Iraq, and, and you didn't even leave the green zone. I had to come inside the green zone to meet with you. You hadn't seen anything, and uh, you haven't seen Iraq. I said, you go out there with me for a week, and you see what I see, and you'll have a whole out, different outlook on uh your job. But so many, there's only about 20% of Congress, I think 19% of Congress are veterans. And I think that has an impact. And I think also as well for those who would run for the office of commander in chief, it's, it's just something that I think, you know, you probably could serve and not have been in the military, but you'd have to have a very good understanding. And it's a concern to me who would and who would not have that ability. Well, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I, I did 27 years of active duty. And one year of that 27 years was in Baghdad. And I certainly learned more during that one year than the other 26 years combined. Because when you're sitting in there and you're dealing with all the things that you just said, and you make those life and that's, I mean, every day of my life, every day of my life, I think about, is there anything I could have done differently to just bring one of those 13 soldiers back? And the answer is no. There's nothing I could have done differently. But it's such a serious deal. But the people that make those decisions... Very few of them have been in that environment and really understand. And I, I last year I attended two different tenth reunions, and in one case met Rachel Bosvell's parents from Wisconsin. I met them, and to stand there and talk to the parents of a child that you lost, you lost their child in Iraq. If every politician could could have that feeling, we wouldn't get involved in some of the stuff that we're involved in. And it's not that. Um I think Americans are anti-military. I think they're sensing what you're saying. We just want to be more careful and more cautious before we commit our troops. Absolutely, because the war, the war is not over. I mean, we left Iraq. I left Iraq 10 years ago. But, you know, the war's not over. My wife would tell you the war's not over for me. Right. And, and I have family members in the military as well, and... And they'll come back from the conflict, and they'll say, we'll be back. We'll have to go back. It's not finished. So when you say it's not finished for you, you're not just talking about the conflict we're still watching on TV. You're talking about it will follow you the rest of your life? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see the faces of those soldiers. Uh, I mean, there's a story uh, story behind each of those soldiers. That battalion commander I killed, I, I, he, that was killed, I've known him since he was the second lieutenant. Yeah, I saw his wife at a funeral a, a year ago. I uh, I saw soldiers that that lost was Specialist Monroe. Last time I saw him, he had had his leg amputated there in Baghdad, and he was he was leaving. And uh, I saw him at the reunion last year. Well, Colonel, um, we're, we're out of time. And I, at the beginning, I have to tell you, I thought an hour. What will we do? Uh, you know, do we need a full hour? And of course, you know, this morning I called you and said, yes, absolutely, I've read the 10 points, we need the full hour, and now I'm thinking we need we need an hour for each point, frankly, for each mistake made. <laughs> I thank you for taking time to put this in pen to paper and allowing the rest of us to see in through your eyes as a br- brigade commander on the ground. I thank you for your service to our, com- our country, and let me just say to you on air, please, I 
the fact that you do question yourself is what makes you such a wonderful commander that you do prize life and that you do take it so seriously. But I just pray God's blessings over you. And I'm thankful that we had someone like you in leadership after talking to you. And, and we'd love to know more about the Abu Gara prism. I mean, it came out with such bad publicity afterwards, but as you know, and we talked about things are not always uh, under your control, even though you're the commander and how things end up. So I, I'll give you, uh, because we're on air online, I'm going to take this uh, freedom, Ryan, I hope it's okay, to give the colonel just a minute in closing and, and give you just the last words to our listeners. But I thank you. I am so honored to have spent this time with you. Thank you, Colonel Spain. Well, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, uh, my, my message to your, to your readers is just, you know, thank God every day that we still somehow find these brave men and women to volunteer. I mean, we've been a volunteer military for 30 some years and I don't know where we get them from. And they just, I told the Congresswoman that half the soldiers, about half the soldiers that were serving under me wasn't even wholly old enough to buy beer back in the United States. And they were over there and we just believed, we believed in what we were doing. And, uh, it's, we just, we just have the greatest military in the world it's because we somehow keep finding these, these uh, incredible men and women and they come from the families and these, Families loan them to the military, and, and they need to be used properly. They sign a check to the U.S. military, signed in blood, and they never know how it will end when they sign. They don't know what the amount will be. Uh, Colonel, I thank you so much for your time today. Colonel Ted Spain has been my guest. You may find the book at Barnes & Noble. I think it's also on Amazon. The book is Breaking Iraq, Ten Mistakes Made, uh, Not military in my background, and yet I find myself wanting to pick up this book and read it. And I, I'm thankful for someone who takes the time to just give us the honest, unvarnished account. Thank you so much, Colonel Ted Spain, for your time and your service today, but your, your service to our country. Thank you, ma'am, for everything you're doing. I am Tamara Scott. You've been listening in to uh, Tamara Scott Live as we bring you truth for our time. And you can always catch the archive on Tamara Scott Live uh, on YouTube. And uh, do what you can today to uh, go out and be kind to your neighbors around you, that we don't have these conflicts. They always start small. They always do. And then we have these large international issues that we're dealing with. Imagine if we could just treat each other with respect where we might end up and not have to start and give up uh, the livelihood of our young men and women. I am Tamara Scott. You can make a difference. Be encouraged. Never be complacent.